Welcome to Podcast the 13th. Tim, how you doing today? I am fantastic. Are you peachy? I am OPG. That's funny that you should say that because today we are going to talk about OPG, or as I like to call the past 10 years of OPG cards, faux PG. Because, get it? Because they're not made by Tops or OPG, but they're made by Upper Deck, who licensed the name OPG from Tops. A little bit of history, and I'm going to probably botch my dates, but. OPG made hockey cards back in the 30s, and then they made cards in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then they eventually ended up selling off their company, but Topps bought or retained the name OPG, and then used it for like parallels and stuff like that, and then even putting out an OPG set or sets uh, in like the late 90s or early 2000s, and then when Topps lost the license to make hockey cards, they did nothing with it for years and years until Upper Deck. Basically, they don't own the name. I don't think any company would sell a trademark like that these days. As far as I know, they lease the name. So the past 10 years, hard to believe 10 years, has been Opeachy sets made by Upper Deck. Tim, what do you want to say about this before <laughs> before I go off on another long-winded spiel? Opeachy's, uh that's the beast set. I mean, every year when that comes out, that's, that's the biggest set to put together for all those set builders that are out there that are still in the hobby. We are a dying breed, but I can tell you this, this is the beast to, to try to put together and assemble each year. Um, Upper Deck does a pretty good job of creating an all-encompassing checklist of pretty much every star player that you would find in most of the smaller sets that have 100 or 200 cards in addition to all of the bench players and you know backup players and a lot of rookies that you don't see in normal products so you, you you'll get them in the OPG and the other thing too is this is one of the first sets that comes out in the year other than artifacts which usually is the first set OPG is one of the first ones that's uh that's hitting the streets. One gripe of mine with Opeachy, and I have many because, you know, I'm a perfectionist, but I think one problem I have with it is that, yes, it does come out early in the season. Sometimes it comes out before the season starts. Uh, sometimes it comes out after the season starts, but too early to put in the guys who make their debut in whatever season the set comes out in. And Upper Deck has found ways of like making sure that they can include this player or that player, usually via an update set, like a full update set, or like a 20 or 30 card update set that you'd find in packs of Upper Deck Series 2. So they always try to get in those guys who you wish were in the set. But I, I think one problem I've always had with the set is that it always seems to come out a little too early. And so you end up with cards of players in their old uniform, but with like a new logo, or you don't get the rookies that you would hope to. Yeah, you, you generally won't get the draft picks that came out of that year's draft just for the simple fact that they haven't played yet. Um, so, you know, their first the first opportunity for a lot of those guys is – in the upcoming season and because it it's released so early you don't have them pictured on a card because nhl rules um obviously you have to play in a game in order to get a card it's another reason why like when artifacts comes out the majority of the rookies that are in artifacts are a player to be named later they all come out as redemptions so you have to scratch them off and then wait halfway through the season before they release their redemption list so because opg is considered to be a lower end product and a more this this can be purchased by everybody type product you know obviously you don't have the higher end volume in there so they pack out what they pack out and that's that's what you get you know, I think I would like redemptions in this set, now that you mention it. I, I think that'd be kind of fun. I remember 2007, 2008, I remember building the MVP set, and it had, like, redemption, not redemption rookies, but it had, like, a redemption card that you could send in to get a rookie pack that had, like, three cards. And I kind of liked that idea, because then they could put in those players who made their debut that season, they'd print up these cards later on in the year, and then send them to you, and they'd be part of the set. And I liked that kind of workaround. I think it's a little crummy when Opeachy comes out in September. 
There's 100 short prints. 50 of them are legend cards. I mean, I don't really need another Maurice Richard card. Like, okay, Maurice Richard on a 2016-17 OPG card. Great. I would rather have more rookie cards. And then, you know, so you get like 50 marquee rookies, 50 marquee legends or whatever they call them. I think I'd rather have more rookies or like less short printed cards that aren't really that spectacular. As far as like base set you're talking? No, no, no. I'm talking about like insert type stuff. So I like the base set. You know, I like having a set with 500 cards, but if you think about it, Upper Deck Series 1, Series 2, that's 400 cards right there, if you don't count the rookies, right? If you don't count the young guns, 400 cards. Right. Okay, four of those are checklists, so 196 cards. Uh, wait, no, uh, uh, 203, uh, 396 cards. So, 296, and then you look at an OPG Massive set. Card. Yeah, I know. You look at an OPG set, 500 base cards, Five of those are probably checklists, so 495. So really, the set is only 20% bigger. It's it's only or 25% bigger. It's not that much bigger when you include the marquee legends, which I think are filler. And you know, like one year, they OPG had like a, it was the first year they had like a 700 card set, but they had marquee rookies, which was great. They had something like a hundred of them, which was ridiculous, but I thought it was cool. Then they had like stat leaders, okay, whatever, and then they had rookie sophomore showdown, or you know, just an excuse to put Crosby and Malkin on a card together. Okay, fine, whatever. And then they had you know paging through this here, they had Hallworthy. Okay, great. Cards of Hall of Fame players who are still playing. I guess that's kind of nice, but not really necessary. And then what do we have here? Team checklists. Um, guess who's on the Penguins team checklist? Mm. Marion Hossa. Nope, just kidding. Sidney Crosby. Paul, Paul Bissonnette. Yes, no. Uh, so, uh, you know, and then like you, you mentioned earlier, or you mentioned before we started this podcast, the team checklists have now become like inserts and like a lot of these things have become like inserts and I guess that's okay. I wouldn't mind if the set was 700 cards, but I'd like it to be like 600 player cards so that it was a lot bigger than upper deck series one and series two combined. And then like a hundred rookie cards because there's still a lot of guys that if you think about it, I mean, again, math is hard For- 18 skaters and two goalies, that's 20. So 10 teams times 20, 200, 400, 600. So you could make a 600-card set just based on if you did 18 skaters and two goalies of all 30 teams. You could, but for the average collector, you're going to end up with about 200 cards of guys that you probably have absolutely zero idea who they are and probably – would never want to know who they are. I, I disagree, because a lot of those guys get a young gun or a marquee rookie, you know. They show up, they play one game, and then, you know, they might stick around for a couple of years, but they're not, like, the greatest player, and so what? I I like sets that were comprehensive. I think that's why people always prefer the old OPG sets, because they had more cards, right? They did. You look at, the, like, uh, like, last year we talked about 84-85 uh, OPG Every team had between 17 and 22 cards. That's a lot. They could, I mean, and and it's a popular set. And nobody's like, oh, well, the Red Wings had three goalies in the set. Actually, I'm not sure if they did, but you get the idea. Like, nobody really complains about that. It's different you and I talking about this because you, if you you flip it on to the other side, and like, like I was saying, you have a set geared towards the lower end collector so i mean packs what, what retail for a buck maybe no I don't, I don't, that's the other buck, thing buck 99 maybe she's like a dollar 59 if you go to like walmart or target and it's like okay. probably three dollars a pack if you buy it in a hobby shop okay so you're talking it, it's not mvp cheap at 99 cents but it's also not regular upper deck pack cheap where they're five bucks a pack or more so, you know, it's somewhere in the middle, and I would consider it more of a lower end. I think that, I mean, I think Upper Deck does a good job with the with the checklist for it. I don't know that throwing out, you know, another 100 players or 150 players is going to make it more desirable. 
put them on the set mm -hmm. because you know if they did that and they cut back on let's say your your marquee legends that that you have a disdain for mm -hmm. let's say we cut those out completely well now you got 50 more cards who do you put on those 50 cards i mean what guy do you go to do you go to the fourth line defenseman guy that may only play 20 games do you go to the you know the the journeyman guy that plays sometimes up but mostly on the AHL team i mean who do who do you, do you decide who gets put on a card. Well, why point. not? I mean, I, I think that would be fine because that's what they did 25, 30 years ago. They would they would put those third and fourth line players. I know exactly what your argument is, and I don't disagree with you, but you know, hearkening back to the olden days of the OPG sets that came out versus what's on the market now, you got to look at one simple thing. They're trying to cater to, to the, the boom idea. And the boom idea is what's in this product that's going to be boom. Look what I hit because it's all about the hits. It's all about the inserts. It's all about the audio. Not in this it's set, all about though. the Jersey. And that's why this is considered more of a, more of a low end set because you don't have the hits as prevalent. You have a ton of inserts. I mean, you open a box of Opeachy, every pack pretty much has some type of insert in it. Right. Whether it's a parallel card whether it's an insert, whether it's a sticker, whether it's, you know, whatever it may be for that particular year. Right. There's something in one of those packs. Yes. But you have, you do have a chance at autographs. They're rare. You do have a chance at jersey cards or what Opeachy calls them, what, souvenirs, I think, is the name that they put on those. Or they have, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's just the plain, the regular plain jersey card. And they're, those are much more rare. I I like the set. I've been trying to put all of them together since they since the inception and um, with you know the the first set in oh six oh seven. I enjoy putting it. I don't I don't necessarily know that it would change my mind whether I like it or not if they mm -hmm. added more players and less maybe less uh, well, filler. Think, as think you about call it. this now. So if you have I'm to. Thinking. The, the biggest problem with these types of sets, the, and what my biggest problem has been with collecting in the past 10 years, is that the short prints, and as you know, you end up with like a whole bunch of extra base cards, right? Throw out Victory as an example. I think 1011, I bought a ton of Victory. There were 50 short prints in that, so I needed to buy 100 packs because you get a Victory rookie in every other pack. So I had to buy 100 packs... And I ended up with, well, I bought over 100 packs. But the thing is, is that, like, I ended up with something crazy, like four or five base sets. I don't remember. And that's the thing, is that you end up with all these extra base sets that you don't want and you don't need. And so what I'm saying is, if the base set was bigger, then you would have reason to buy more packs anyway. So if you do a 600-card base set... And then you do 100 short prints. I don't care what they are. Rookies, legends, whatever. So if you did 100 and... If you did 100 short prints and you did one in every other pack, then you'd have to buy 200 packs. And then if you figured there's 8 cards per pack, but really 7 of them, you would need to buy that many packs anyway just to complete the base set or to get close to it. And I would rather have that. I mean... That's why I think it's ridiculous when you have these sets where you have 100 base cards. Like, say, like, um, what, like SP Authentic or Ice or those sets where you buy two boxes and you end up with the base set and you have, like, three out of 100 rookie cards or three out of 50 rookie cards or whatever, right? So you have no real incentive, like, or you buy 100 boxes of that and then you end up with all the rookie cards and then you end up with, like, 100, 100 card base sets. With Opeachy, if they put in more base cards and I wouldn't mind having to buy so many damn boxes anyway. Does that make sense? It does make sense. But Thank there's you. one there's one key factor in all of that. The fatal flaw to my logic. And that's the collation has to be in your in the last few years with OPG, that is not the case. No, you're because right. Because there were a few years in the middle and I'm not going to count the first year because I can't tell you how many boxes of 06, 07 that I've opened, and I still am almost 100 cards shy of a full base set. Now, keep in mind, the last 100, 150 cards are short printed, supposedly. Yeah, 200. So all of the what would normally be inserts and all of the rookies and so on and so forth. 
No, I get that. But I've opened boxes that I've purchased. And again, coming from the same dealers and they've been back to back in piles. So you assume back to back means they probably came from the same case Mm -hmm. where I've gotten different base cards, but all of the, all of the high numbers, all of the short prints were the same in both boxes. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Then you have years like 2013. Was it 13, where, 14 or yeah, I think it was 13, 14 where every box, every card you got was e five or seven or it ended in a one, three or I think it was a one, three or a nine or it ended in the other numbers. Right. And so everybody that had them, and was making set lists. You could look at their checklist that they needed and you saw a pattern. So you knew exactly what boxes they bought because of exactly which cards they got. And so everybody that got dupes, somebody else had the exact dupes that you needed. So the collation has to be pretty much perfect. And that's the case in most, you know, most situations, unless, unless there's only, you know, a hundred base cards and you can pull all hundred out of a box, which most of the mid to higher end sets are, are set up. Like, you know, the lower end stuff, your chance of pulling, uh, I mean, I'm glad I'm glad you don't see duplicates in the same box anymore as often. I, sh- I, I put the little asterisk as often, but at the same time, you know, when you when you buy three or four boxes or even a full case, you should at least be able to complete one set, mm-hmm. and that's not always the case with the way these are packed out. Right, and it, I, I did buy a case of 2012, 13. And I did make, um, I mean, out of a case, you should hope so, but I did make a complete, like, base set, a complete marquee rookie set. I think I ended up making, like, four complete base sets. Um, it It was pretty good. I mean, the collation that year was good. I was thinking about doing it the next year, and then I saw that everybody was blogging about how terrible the collation was. Then I was just like, all right, maybe I'll, I'll back off. I mean, look... I know if you buy enough cards to build a set, you're not going to get, you're, you're almost not going to get it. I mean, especially with something that's like 500 cards, 600 cards. But um, I, you at least have a reason to buy them. I mean, if you're, if you're buying packs of victory and you already have the complete set, base set, and you're just hoping that the short printed rookie card that you might get in every other pack is one that you need. It's kind of thankless versus like, Hey, well, I still need, you know, a hundred base cards. So this is worth it. Worth me trying. Right. Yeah. I can see that. Another thing I wanted to just mention was that most of the years. So 2006, seven was kind of an anomaly. And the reason why I say that is because I thought that year, the quality of the OPG cards were very good. They're glossy on the front. They're glossy on the back. The design was kind of simple. I mean, I always made fun of the fact that the OPG logo was uh, up until about uh, 12, 13. They always made that logo so ridiculously large. But I liked the first year because the cards felt nice. They were comparable to Victory. They had color fronts, color backs. They were glossy on both sides. Then the next year they started printing on this really crummy cardboard 2007 8 is pretty terrible it's like gray cereal box cardboard uh and i i think that annoyed me like i think if i get that the old opg cards were printed on not the greatest stock but even old opg cards are easier to read than like something like the 2007 8 cards or uh i mean take your pick they're all not so great you know it's plain cardboard that's really what you get and that's okay too like that it, it it's plain here's the other thing and i have a theory that upper deck has to pay a lot to get the rights to the name opichi because if you buy a pack of victory it's 99 cents and you get like what eight cards and if you buy a pack of opichi it's a dollar 59 and it's eight cards and the cards are a lot lower in quality like way lower in quality. So I think that they must have to pay, like they're probably making a cheaper product and charging more for it 
to offset whatever they have to pay tops. That's my theory anyway. Or or is it a case of what's old is new? You know, what used to be a cheap form of a cheap medium to print on may not be the cheap thing anymore. Because I, everybody wants the glossy the glossy type print, so maybe that's in more that's more prevalent. I don't know. No, I don't I, know what the answer is. I don't think people would really mind if the if the cards were nicer. Like nobody goes like you go to a movie. I would. Nobody I says, would. "Oh, I wish there were black and white movies like they used to have." Right? I when like I go black to the theater. and white movies. I wish there were like you know my grandmother never she never lamented the fact that movies had sound and color. Never once heard her complain about talkies. You know that you know technology. Yay, right? Whatever it is. So like I mean, for instance, I don't know why cards aren't printed on plastic. I mean, why not? You could do it. You could do it cheaply. They'd be more durable, right? Like plastic, like a credit card yeah, plastic? Yeah, absolutely. They don't have to be that thick. But you could do, like, I know there was like a, a couple of years ago, there was like a Russian hockey card set, and they were printed on plastic. But hell, if you go back to like uh, Upper Deck Ice, or even like back in the 90s, like those classic draft picks had like those cards that were printed on acetate, remember? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those look pretty cool. I mean, I don't know. So what I'm saying is that there's no excuse to print on cheap cardboard if you could at least do something as nice as Upper Deck Series 1, Series 2, or, hey, even raise the stakes and, and, and put it on an even nicer uh, nicer uh, medium. I suppose you could, but do it on something other than OPG because OPG is really the only set that's like this. Yeah, I guess so. So... One thing I wanted to point out was, so it got a little, like they got, Upper Deck tried some different things with this, and I thought that that's okay. So they went with their super huge set in 2006, 2007, uh, 2007, 2008. They decided to scale it back by 100 cards. They did a lot of like inserts instead, like checklists and stuff like that. 2008, 2009 is a really tough set to build a master set of just of cards one through eight hundred, because one through six hundred were your set your that came out in packs. But then they put out like an update set that came out in packs. Now here's the funny thing about that: it was something like five cards per pack, but then there were two hundred cards in the set, and then every pack had like one or two inserts. I forget what it was, but I remember standing there and doing the math and thinking, do I want to buy boxes of this? And then I'm like, oh man, every pack has a metal parallel. And then they did like metal parallels of like, I think one through 600 in that, if I'm not mistaken. So then all of a sudden I, I did the math and I'm like, well, 24 packs. I'm like, I'm only going to get like 80 cards towards the set. Like, it just, it, it just, it was just a total beast. That was even harder to put together. And I, I never even bothered. Well, and if you talk about doing a master set, now you have all of the retro parallels. Not only do you have your base 1 through 600, but you also have your additional 600 cards and your additional 600 that are rainbow and your additional 600 that are black and your additional 600 that are you know whatever other parallel that they've come up with for that particular year yeah i think master sets are impossible anymore and that's okay like i think it's kind of thankless to have to collect the same card four times I, i think it's great for player collectors you know i'm always looking for those those parallels of chris chelios or carter hutton fyi Otherwise, like, yeah, I have no desire to, like, get all 600 or 700 or whatever. So, 2008, 2009, they did the update set that came out in packs. The next year, 2009, 10, they did a 200-card boxed update set, which I thought was a fantastic idea. Unfortunately, those sets did not sell through as well. I remember going to a show and buying a set for like 20 bucks and just being like, okay, this is awesome. 200 cards, 20 bucks. I have cards 601 through 800, uh, including John Tavares' rookie card and Victor Hedman's rookie card. And then I guess they just didn't sell that well because like 
a year later, you were still finding them at shows marked down to like $10, which I understand things get marked down all the time. It's just part of the the circle of life when it comes to trading cards. But I would have loved to have had an update set every year. And that doesn't look like that happens other than them, you know, squeezing in 20 or 30 update cards in Upper Deck Series 2. Do you have a do you have a preference? That's really the only way that they can get them in collectors' hands because because there aren't you know like I said set collecting has gone the way of the dinosaur so you don't have the set builders that are out there that are willing to plop down the money on a regular basis for update sets and and whatnot like that. So Wait, I mean, for us for us it's great because we don't have to sit there and buy twelve boxes of something just to get two hundred cards. We can get them all at once and be done with it, put them in, put them in with our set and feel like we've accomplished something. Mm -hmm. For everybody else, I mean, by the time that update set comes out and it's available on the market for people to buy, people have forgotten about Opeachy because it comes out so early in the year. And they're like, oh, oh Opeachy? Didn't that come out already? What is this? Mm -hmm. and, and they probably all ignore it. When they come out with Series 2, all the hype is around those young guns. So everybody wants those young guns from the later from later in the year, those rookies that are hot. You know, everybody's looking to pull, you know, the next big thing out of series two. Why not throw it in there and add it to somebody? Oh yeah, by the way, I didn't know he wasn't in the, the base set. Oh, maybe I should go back and, and check this and mm -hmm. see what's there. I like I I like I agree with you. I I'd love that to be available and I think there could be a market for both. I'd like to see Upper Deck maybe do do like a small print run of complete update and make it available to sell. You know, see if a couple distributors pick it up or a couple brick and mortar stores pick it up or be able to order it online. You know, you know, if you buy two boxes of the base product and save your UPC code, you can send them in along with ten bucks and we'll give you the update set or something like that. That's a good idea. Actually that that would be a great idea. Like even if it was like send in a hundred wrappers because you know the people who buy a hundred packs of the cards are going to want to probably get the update set right like if they're seriously building the set you know that would give me incentive to buy a hundred packs right there just to get uh, an update set you know speaking when, of wrapper redemption on opg that's yep. another thing that, that grinds my gears right there uh -oh. it's the fact that canada gets a wrapper redemption program and we get squat you know, occasionally there might be something at a national show or maybe a big regional show where they'll have something, bring a couple wrappers, and we'll give you this card. But Canada every year gets the wrapper redemption where they can get those red border cards. Mm -hmm. And we're left having to either buy them on eBay or, and this happens a lot within our community, especially with the set builders and the, the player collectors. I don't know. I understand that hockey is quote unquote Canada's sport and there's a bigger market for it up there. But I don't know. I, f I feel feel left out on that. End rant. <laughs> no, and you're right, too. I mean, I, I agree. I think, I mean, okay, yeah, hockey is more popular in Canada. I get it. But the U.S. has more hockey teams than Canada. Probably has, because of the higher population in the U.S., there's probably as many hockey fans. I mean, I can't really... I don't really have the hard numbers behind that, but I guess, yeah, sure, everybody in Canada likes hockey, or almost everybody in Canada probably likes hockey, uh, and in the U.S., probably everybody likes a sport besides hockey. I get that, but there are a lot of fans here, and yeah, I definitely do feel left out. That does annoy me. I mean, it even annoys me, like, back in, like, you know, Panini stickers, like the sticker albums would sometimes have an offer on the back of the, the album, and it would say, only valid in Canada. Only valid in Canada. Right, yep. and it's just like, well, gee, to the kids in the other 14 cities at the time who are buying this in the U.S., it kind of sucks, right? Like, that I can't participate in this, uh, well, whatever it is. So, yeah, I get that, totally. I don't think that would be too hard for them to facilitate either. I mean... Upper Decks in California, the Redemption Centers in North Carolina, they could make this happen. They could make this happen if they wanted to. Uh, I think another thing, what would you think if OPG uh, went to like a Series 1, Series 2 like Upper Deck? I don't like it. Why not? I don't like it. I just, Smaller I, sets, I mean, easier to build. Opeachy's the set to go after right away. 
and the fact that I can I can go out there at the beginning of the season or you know be able to like put all of the stuff together and at least make an attempt to complete it before the season starts that's, that's always my goal mm-hmm. complete Opeachy before the season starts how, how's that goal working out I've for spent you? the last 10 years failing at my goal ah. yeah, I, I've spent the last 10 years failing at my goal Maybe you um, should reassess but, those goals, as Doctor Phil I, would say. I still, I still keep doing it, and I still keep working at them year after year. I don't want to see Opeachy go to two series, Upper Decks flagship broken down into two series. I think that's that's perfect. It's been that way for a while. It works, and it draws excitement to the product. I don't think they should change that. But that's that's my own personal opinion. Do you have a favorite year? for OPG or faux PG the past 10 years, uh, the upper deck OPG as far as like checklist or far as design or well, I, kinda, well, I, whatever. Think, I think design, because I mean, checklist, you're kind of at the mercy of who makes a debut that year. Like, you know, Oh seven, Oh eight had a pretty good checklist, you know, Oh eight, Oh nine, maybe not as strong. La- last year's set. I liked cause it kind of reminded me of like, was it 83 or 84 with the little circle. Yeah. 82, 83. Corner. Yeah. I think I'm probably going to go with, I think I'd probably go with like 08, 09. Hmm. Maybe. No, you know what? 9, 10. That would be my favorite. 9, 10. 9, 10, nine, yeah, nine, nine, 10, ten was would be good. my favorite because they, I think they, they did more with the, the photo. They pulled the photo as the central point of the mm-hmm. card and mm-hmm. left the logo kind of centered off at the top. So it, it kind of brought more of the picture and, that's the only year that Bill Guerin has a card as a penguin. So, do you know? Oh, uh, interesting. Do you notice yeah. that like they used a backwards E, or no? I'm sorry, they used the E and OPG to as like a pattern along the sides and at the top and bottom. Yeah, in the background design. Isn't that cool? I like that. Yeah, and it kind of fades up through the card, but it, it maintains consistency throughout the product. I mean, the marquee legends, the rookies, everything else. Now, the rookies and legends, the the photos smaller. Because they kind of draw attention to the fact that it's a rookie or a legend card, but at the same time, you know, again, these are filler more or less. But so I, I would say that's probably that's probably my favorite design. It's a very colorful one. That is that is a good year. I yeah, and you're right. It is colorful, especially when you look back, like how the previous years depended so much on like gold borders. Uh, you know, six, seven, seven, eight. 8-9 has a lot of gold borders. And then, yeah, nine ten they got really colorful. I think I liked 12-13. Uh, that was really the first year where I thought, okay, they finally got it right because they made the OPG logo small. They made the player name big. I liked it. I mean, a lot of emphasis on the photograph. No ridiculously huge OPG logo. Uh, That's the one thing that was missing on that one. The OPG logo was... Uh... Normal basically sized. normal size and for for an OPG product it was basically nowhere to be found well no they, it was there it was there at the bottom but it was sure, subtle. It's there but it's very small the only thing i didn't like about that i don't know it's part of the design but the little shadow box guy hockey mm-hmm. player guy yep it's it's on a lot of the base cards i don't i don't get it i guess i don't get i don't get what that serves is that part of some kind of retro design? Is that is that harken back to an old set of yore that I don't remember, or what? I don't know. I mean, I think it's just like I know, like I know, like ninety ninety one score had like the little silhouetted player in the bottom, if you recall. I don't know. I thought that was okay. The only problem with the set was that you know it was hampered by the the lockout, so you didn't have any really good rookie cards. I mean. I guess they could only have the rookies from the previous season in it, and then they couldn't put any new new players in it. And I think that was, I mean, I, I think that kind of made the set less popular. They couldn't really update it. But yeah, you're right. They couldn't really update it like via Upper Deck Series Two or anything like that. I think the next year is kind of nice too. It's pretty colorful. It has like the diagonal borders. It, that one actually feels really 1980s because it was just like, okay, what the hell, let's just go with crazy colors, or bright colors at least. So it feels a lot more fun. And then 14-15, uh, yeah, that one feels a lot like the 82-83 set with the logo at the bottom. I mean, these were three pretty solid years for design. And then 
15, 16, I feel, is a little cluttered. I mean, you know, I could pick all of these designs apart. People are going to buy them regardless of whether the design is okay or great. I think people are going to buy it because it's, you know, 500, 600 card set, and that's the kind of set they want, not the 200 or 100 card set. I like this year's rookie and marquee legend design. I don't know why. It's encroaching more on cutting away the picture. Mm-hmm. But I just like the I like I like the design. I like the way it's set up for some reason. It's appealing to me. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. But you know, that actually looks like that could have been like another set, like a more higher end set, the the, the look of it almost. Like don't don't the, the rookie cards from fifteen sixteen OPG and the base cards look like they could be from Maybe SP authentic. Like, can't be can't be SP because they don't have a completely white background. <laughs> okay, okay, and it can't be SPX because there's not a giant X behind it. Yeah, and they're not horizontal. Right, but I mean, doesn't it feel like it could be from like a higher end set? Yeah, I could see that. But especially especially on the rookie ones, they look really good on the Peachy Platinum. I think. Now, what I understand for next season's Opeachy set. From what I read, they're going to have cards of mascots, but they're going to be, like, super hard to get. Yeah, I I heard that, too. They're going to be inserted. Are they a Kate hit? Is that what I read? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a terrible idea. I think that it's, it's fun to have cards of mascots. I mean, I make fun of them all the time, but, like, I think that's a fun idea, and... I think that would that would have just been a cool. I mean, who would not have if they were one per box or one in every ten packs or whatever? Who wouldn't have finished that completed? You know, a mascot set. I think everybody would have, right? Um, you well, I mean, I know you don't do baseball, but you see how popular they are in Topps Opening Day. Are they are they popular I mean, in Topps Opening Day? People scrounge things up, so they what? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! I said definitely. Those okay. are those are there's a lot of people out there that that snatch those up pretty quick. Right, but if you make them now one per case, that's no fun. And I'm almost I'm even wondering if it was one per case. It might even be more than that because they were going to do it wasn't it like mascots and then they were going to have like patches of their, their unif or their outfits or something mm-hmm. were going to be in there or something like that. I don't know. Are you planning on buying OPG this year? Of course. I may not get it when it, right when it comes out this year, but I will partake in a box or two. Okay, and uh, not completed in time, right? In time for opening puck drop. Mm-hmm.